Willy Wonka is one of the most recognizable characters in popular fiction over the past 60 years. The mysterious, recluse chocolatier was the figment of the imagination of Roald Dahl, first realized in his 1964 children's novel Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Thanks to the novel, its sequel Charlie and the Glass Elevator, as well as movies in 1971, 2005, and 2023, the fifth generation of children from boomers to Generation Alpha will grow up in awe of the wonders of Willy Wonka. Where did he come from? How has he impacted our lives? And most importantly, how has his story changed across so many tellings? And where does Willy Wonka go from here? Is he a villain, a hero, or a twisted character created by the mind of a once battered child riding his way through the tragedy of his own children? The truth may change everything you know about one of your favorite childhood stories. This is the definitive history of Willy Wonka, and we promise you've never heard his story told like this before. Perfect. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. It's a TV dinner. It's Wonka Vision. It could change the world. And make sure you stay tuned until later, where we'll show you why trade coffee will change the way you experience your coffee at home. And if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please do so now. And give us a thumbs up if you want more videos like this. And make sure you stay tuned to the end to see how to get this awesome Wonka Boat Tours graphic design. Wonka, this has gone far enough. Quite right, sir. Stop the boat. If you're a fan of the movies, you might be surprised to learn that Willy Wonka isn't the main character of the story. That honor goes to Charlie Bucket, who in the novel is the childhood embodiment of all that is virtuous. But while the story may be about Charlie's journey, the magic, mystery, and intrigue are found in the complicated character of chocolate maker Willy Wonka. Both a dream maker and savior figure, Wonka is also flawed and of questionable character. But why? And how has this affected the story as it's been transformed from book to three-time theatrical release. Lumpa, lumpa. I'm not in premium economy. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was published in 1964 by British author Roald Dahl when he was 48 years old. But the inspiration for the story and Willy Wonka went all the way back to 1929 when he was only 13 years old. It was here at Repton School in Derbyshire that Dahl would not only experience hazing and ritual cruelty from other children at the school, but he would have an odd run-in with chocolate. The Cadbury Company which was close by, sent test packages of chocolate to his school, and in exchange, they were interested in the opinions of the children. Both Cadbury and Roundtree, two of England's largest chocolate makers, were in a war of ideas, often stealing each other's trade secrets by sending spies into each other's factories. Sound familiar? This combination of secrecy and Dahl believing there must be a huge hidden invention room deep inside these factories where they were experimenting on all sorts of wonderful new treats is what initially gave birth to Willy Wonka. But the story would only ruminate in his mind for the next 30 years until his young daughters Olivia and Chantal were born and he began telling them bedtime stories. Dahl was already a working writer, but it was this time with his children and the stories he created for them that would end up making him one of the greatest children writers of all time. Despite his accolades for writing children's stories, what most people don't know is that Dahl created Willy Wonka and wrote Charlie in the Chocolate Factory during one of the worst times in his life. Following the joy he felt writing James and the Giant Peach, Dahl resurrected the idea of his chocolate story, and in 1960 began writing that classic, Charlie's Chocolate Boy. That's right, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory had a different working title. Charlie was originally encased in chocolate and given to another child as an Easter present. Something else most people don't know is Charlie was initially written to be a little black boy, but his agent who thought it was a bad idea convinced Dahl to make him white because people would ask why. Dahl made the change in 1960 during the height of the civil rights movement in the United States, where that same year the NAACP Youth Council chapters staged sit-ins at white-only lunch counters in the South. Dahl, living in New York at the time, would have been aware of growing racial tensions in the country. While he was penning what would become Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, his first son Theo was born. Tragically, on December 5th, only four months after Theo was born, his baby carriage, which is Nanny was pushing was struck by a 
taxi cab in New York City. The child suffered unimaginable injuries. His skull was shattered and he was diagnosed with neurological deficit. Dahl had been in his apartment working on the chocolate factory at the time of the accident. Dahl quit writing and devoted himself to saving his son's life. Willy Wonka would have to wait. In 1961, wanting a change in scenery, Dahl moved his family back to England. And while his wife Patricia Dean was co-starring in the movie HUD with Paul Newman in 1962, Dahl went back to work on Charlie again. But in November, his oldest daughter Olivia came home from school with the measles. While teaching her how to make little animals out of colored pipe cleaners, he noticed her fingers and her mind were not working together, and she began to feel sleepy. Twelve hours later, she died. Dahl went into the greatest depression of his life. To escape the tragic heartbreak, he eventually channeled his emotions into Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Dahl's biographer Donald Sturrock said he wrote the book during the most difficult four years of his life. He believed Dahl's feelings of helplessness over what had happened to his children is what helped him create the story because it was the only thing he could control in his life at that time. And it's in this that we can see the first formation of Willy Wonka. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Sturrock would explain that Dahl poured himself into Wonka. And the more you understand about the difficult circumstances of the author's private life as he was writing the book, the more sympathetic and extraordinary Wonka becomes. With the sense of magic and genius of the inventor, it is clear that in Wonka there is a strong, dominant personality that can overcome anything. And for Dahl, overcoming anything meant overcoming the tragedy of his children. In Dahl's imagination and grief, he captured something. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was published in 1964 in the United States and became an instant bestseller. Children loved Dahl's book and fantasized about finding a golden ticket and visiting that magical chocolate factory. One 10-year-old little girl named Madeline loved it so much, she wanted someone to make a movie about it. So she told her dad. Madeline's dad just happened to be Mel Stewart, a Hollywood director who had been making documentaries throughout the early 60s. Stewart took the book and reached out to David Walper, who had produced several of Stewart's documentaries, and asked him what he thought about it. Sometimes the stars just line up. Walper happened to be in the middle of talks with Quaker Oats Company about a way to introduce a new candy bar from its newly acquired confection company. Whopper saw the chance to combine both opportunities and persuaded Quaker Oats, who had no experience in the film industry, to buy the movie rights to the book and finance a motion picture for the purpose of promoting Quaker Oats' new Wonka bar. So for the cool price of three million dollars, Quaker Oats agreed to finance the film. And while a big box office release is great, it was this next thing that made Willy Wonka a legendary figure in popular culture. But before I share a little known fact about Willy Wonka, let me first tell you how to mix a little chocolate into your Java with this video sponsor, Trade Coffee. Our day just doesn't start off right without a perfect cup of joe. And that's why we prefer Trade Coffee. Trade is a coffee subscription service that allows you to experience a curated for you coffee delivered to your door helping you make better coffee at home when and how you want it. We love that the coffee is high quality, conveniently delivered, and personalized for our taste buds. It's exciting every time a new package arrives on our doorstep. Trade has built relationships with over 55 local roasters so you can enjoy their craft from the comfort of your own home. Trade maps your specific preferences to hundreds of different coffee flavor profiles. Their technology pairs you with the best coffees using art and science, marrying industry expertise and machine learning. Trade roasts your coffee to order and delivers it exactly when you need it. There's multiple ways to experience coffee with Trade. Sign up for a subscription or try one of their starter packs today. You can get a free bag of fresh coffee with any subscription purchase by visiting drinktrade.com slash popcast. Join us and give yourself or a loved one the gift of high quality personalized coffee today with Trade. <laughs> Wasn't that just magnificent? I was worried he was getting a little dodgy in the middle part, but then that finale. If what Quaker reportedly did next is true, then Willy Wonka owes that cereal company a debt of gratitude. The story goes that Quaker Oats agreed to finance the film, but it had one stipulation. They'd only agree to make the movie if the name was changed from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory so they could take advantage of the Willy Wonka brand on their new candy bars. It makes sense.
sense, but there are a few stories floating around about this. One is that the term Mr. Charlie had been used as an expression in the black community for a white man in power, and press reports claim that the change was due to pressure from black groups. At the same time, reports that Vietnam soldiers were using the derisive term Charlie for the Viet Cong, and the filmmakers didn't want it to be associated with that. And while the NAACP had taken issue with the original Oompa Loompas depicted as African pygmies, Stewart addressed those concerns and changed them to Little Orange Skin Men. The studios publicly stated that the name change was to put emphasis on the eccentric Willy Wonka, and Walper said he changed the title to make the product placement for the Wonka Bar have a closer association. So whether it was a demand by Quaker or a great idea by Walper, that decision squarely put the name Willy Wonka in the minds of multiple generations of children. Well, that and an unforgettable performance by the man who would bring the chocolate maker to life. There's nothing to it. Gene Wilder will be remembered for many of his roles, but none more than the mysterious Willy Wonka. Dudley Moore and a slew of other actors were being considered for the role before Gene walked in for an audition. Actors had been auditioning for the role in a suite at the Plaza Hotel in New York all week, and then Wilder walked in. Stewart and Walper realized they could stop looking. Walper even remarked the role fit him tighter than one of Jacques Cousteau's wetsuits. Stewart saw what all of us saw on screen. He was captivated by the way Wilder Wilder caught humor in his eyes, and he had the sardonic, demonic edge they were looking for. At one point, Walper had to suppress Stewart's excitement so he could negotiate Wilder's salary, but the director didn't care and ran into the hall as Gene was leaving and offered him the part of Wonka. But Wilder would only accept the role under one condition. He wanted Wonka to carry a cane and have a limp during his first entrance. He said after they see Wonka cripple and whisper among themselves, he would lose his cane and begin falling forward, and just before hitting the ground, he would do a beautiful somersault and bounce to great applause. Stewart looked at him and asked, what do you want to do that for? Wilder told him, because from that time on, no one will know if I'm lying or telling the truth. Stewart agreed, and he was right. The entrance of Willy Wonka in the 1971 movie set the uneasy tone for the character. So you get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir! Oscar winner Jack Albertson was brought in to play Grandpa Joe, and Sammy Davis Jr., who would go on to make a hit out of the Candyman song, wanted the role of Bill, the candy shop owner. But Stewart felt that the presence of a big star in that scene would break reality. Once the deal was done to make the movie, Walper agreed with Dahl to write the screenplay. And although he was credited for the film, Dahl had not delivered a completed screenplay at the start of production and only provided an outline pointing to sections of the book. David Seltzer would end up coming in for the rewrite after Dahl left unhappy about the choices for the film. Not only did Dahl not like the name change or that the story had some differences from the book, but he didn't like the casting of Gene Wilder as Wonka. Dahl thought Wilder was pretentious and preferred Spike Milligan or Peter Sellers as Wonka. Dahl also hated the iconic musical score, calling it sappy and overly sentimental. His dislike extended to the character of Charlie Bucket and the film as a whole as being more optimistic than his novel. But just like Stephen King hated the movie version of his novel, The Shining, audiences loved it. And the same thing would happen to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, eventually. Here's Johnny! The movie began filming on location in Germany because the production didn't have enough money to film stateside. Stewart chose Munich because he wanted the viewer to be in a never-never land, and at the time, very few people had been there. Filming took a little more than two and a half months. Ten actors of short stature were the Oompa Loompas, including one woman and nine men who were cast internationally. The child actors were auditioned from hundreds. In the end, Julie Don Cole, Denise Nickerson, Peter Ostrom, Paris Themen, and Michael Bolner were selected to play Veruca, Violet, Charlie, Mike TV, and Augustus. Four of the kids had previous acting experience, but Michael had seen an ad in a local Bavarian paper and his mom thought her big boy would be perfect for the part. The kids, now adults, recalled in a 2003 documentary how sweet Gene had been with all of them. Apparently, all of the kids were great, with the exception of Themen, who played Mike TV. He was apparently a little difficult to wrangle, going so far as to release bees that were being kept under glass for one of the invention prop rooms, which then stung him. As anyone who has seen the movie would say, the show-stopping set of the film is the Chocolate Room. Created by Oscar-winning set designers, they transformed a giant Munich warehouse into Willy Wonka's Chocolate Room, complete with a chocolate river, chocolate waterfall, and wall-to-wall 
wall edible delights. The director was careful not to let any of the children see the set until the first shot so he could get their genuine reactions. An interesting fact about the Chocolate Room is that the Chocolate River was initially made from 150,000 gallons of water, real chocolate, and cream. But the filmmakers had to change the formula because the original concoction turned blood red. And also because of the cream, the mixture began to spoil, and by the end of filming, it smelled terrible. The chocolate room was everything a child could wish for, unless you didn't like chocolate. And that's exactly what happened to Julie, who played Veruca Salt. There is a scene where she smashes open a pumpkin and then has to reach in and pull out gobs of chocolate and eat it. But she hated it, so they had to shoot the scene over and over until it looked like she was enjoying it. Stewart's preferred directing style was to keep the actors in the dark as much as possible. He really wanted genuine reactions. Besides the chocolate room, reactions to Wonka limping, his psychotic singing in the tunnel, and the final scene where Wonka shouts at Charlie and Grandpa Joe were all genuine reactions from the actors. Stewart was so into his method directing, while the Wonkantania was on a track in the chocolate river, the actor playing the Oompa Loompa at the helm thought he was actually steering the boat. You can see him in the scenes carefully turning the helm as if he was worried he would wreck the boat, but it seems to have worked. Seeing the genuine reactions gave all of us a richer experience and added to the quality and believability of Gene Wilder's performance. Despite Dahl's anger over the movie, he did visit the set during filming and seemed very happy. He even attended the premiere. The fantasy musical Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory opened in theaters on June 30th, 1971, and it was a failure. Nonsense now and then is relished by the wisest earning only $4 million on its $3 million budget, the film was a huge disappointment for everyone, especially Quaker Oats, who had paid for the film, but doubly because they weren't able to get the actual Wonka bar right for the release. Something in the ingredients was causing the candy bar to melt too fast, even in cooler temperatures, so Quaker Oats pulled all of them off the shelves. If you want to know more about what happened to the Wonka bar, check out our You Get Nothing video right after this one. So, despite being nominated for an Academy award for best music, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory appeared destined to fall into the deep, dark, forgettable pit of bygone movies. And then something interesting happened. After three and a half years, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was pretty much an afterthought. But Gene Wilder would experience his first success in 1974 with Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein. He was a hot commodity, so NBC decided they would give Wonka its first TV airing on Thanksgiving in 1974. It seemed to be a success so they did it again the following year after an NFL football game on November 23rd between the Oakland Raiders and the Washington Redskins. But when the game went 45 minutes over its schedule thanks to overtime, NBC joined Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory 45 minutes into the film to keep the network on schedule. The angry reaction from parents and children was swift and immediate. The network received more than 1,000 calls from people upset that they missed the beginning of the movie. To make up for the blunder, NBC re-aired the movie on May 2nd, 1976. The next year, when it was time to renew for the rights of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, neither Paramount nor Quaker Oats saw the potential of the movie. But Warner Brothers did. Quaker Oats unloaded the rights to Warner for $500,000, just in time for the VCR craze, and Willy Wonka was about to blow up. It was 1985, and VCR machines were finally coming down in price. 11.5 million VCRs were sold in the U.S., and Warner Brothers Brothers made its move to make Charlie and the Chocolate Factory available for purchase on VHS tape. And thanks to Disney's stubborn policy of putting much of their animated features in the vault for rare and expensive releases on VHS, other family entertainment videos were purchased, and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was a must-have in nearly every home. The movie that had failed at the box office had become a VHS cult classic. In 1996, the 25th anniversary theatrical re-release also grossed the film another $21 million. But a few years before the theatrical re-release, in 1991, Warner Brothers knew what it had and desperately wanted a chance to update and remake the movie. But they needed the rights to remake the film from Dahl's estate. The author had passed away the previous year, and after his dislike for the first movie, the family was reluctant to make a deal. It would take the studio seven years of courting, finally getting the rights to make the movie in 1998. But just because they had the rights didn't mean they could do what they want. 
the family maintained artistic control over the choice of actors, directors, and writers. Ang Lee, Terry Gilliam, Anthony Minghella, and Spike Jones were Doll's Widow's choice for director. Scott Frank was hired to write the screenplay in 1999 after asking for the job. He was a recent Oscar nominee for Out of Sight and wanted to work on a film his children could enjoy. He was a huge fan of the book and intended to remain faithful to Doll's vision instead of the 1971 film. Nicolas Cage was discussed to play Wonka, but he lost interest. The studio had also shown interest in Bill Murray, Michael Keaton, Brad Pitt, Will Smith, and Adam Sandler for the role of the chocolate maker. Gary Ross signed on to direct in February 2000, which forced Frank to write a second screenplay. Both of them would end up leaving in September 2001. The Doll Estate and the studio wanted Frank to stay on, but he had scheduling and contract obligations with Minority Report. Director Rob Minkoff, who had co-directed The Lion King, was brought in with writer Gwen Laurie, and they started over from scratch on a new script in February 2002. Laurie agreed to adapt the original book and ignore the 1971 film, but efforts didn't go over well, and only two months later, Martin Scorsese became involved with the film briefly, although he opted out to direct The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio. Warner Brothers president Alan Horn wanted Tom Shadyak, who wrote Ace Ventura Pet Detective, to direct the movie with Jim Carrey as Willy Wonka, believing the pair could make Charlie and the Chocolate Factory relevant to mainstream audiences. But Doll's Widow didn't like the idea. That's a version we'd personally love to have seen. Then in early 2003, Tim Burton, known for pioneering golf culture in the film industry and known for his films like Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, and The Nightmare Before Christmas, became interested in the project. During a visit to Dahl's former home in the village of Great Missenden, he told Dahl's widow that Rold's famed writing shed was the Bucket's house. She thought, thank God, someone gets it. Burton was hired after receiving enthusiastic approval from the Dahl estate. His widow said Burton was the first and only director she was happy with. Burton had produced another of Dahl's adaptations with James and the Giant Peach in 1996, and like the author, Burton disliked the 1971 film because it strayed from the book's storyline. Lurie's script received a rewrite by Pamela Petler, who worked with Burton on Corpse Bride, but he chose to hire Big Fish screenwriter John August in December 2003 to start from scratch. August had never seen the 1971 movie and decided to go through the book with a highlighter and save little bits of scene description so it would sound like the author. Burton and August included many of the parts of the book that were absent from the 1971 movie, including the construction of the Indian Prince's Palace, the inclusion of Charlie's father, and Veruca Salt's attack by squirrels. But while they tried to remain with the source material, they couldn't help but to explore the themes of family and unearthing Willy Wonka's origin. Despite the additions, Burton felt it was in the spirit of the book. Warner Brothers had wanted Charlie's father removed from the film, so Wonka Wonka could become the father figure, just as he had in the 1971 film. But Burton believed Wonka would not be a good father, thinking the character was similar to a recluse. So many names had been considered and discussed by the studio to play Wonka. Yes, the ones we mentioned earlier, but also Christopher Walken, Steve Martin, Robin Williams, Robert De Niro, Mike Myers, Ben Stiller, and even Patrick Stewart. Shut up, Wesley. Even Dustin Hoffman and Marilyn Manson wanted the role. Michael Jackson wanted the role so bad, he recorded an original soundtrack for the film at his Los Angeles studio. But Warner Brothers didn't want Jackson for the role, considering him unmarketable, with rumors about inappropriate relationships with children. That said, Warner Brothers went nuts over the soundtrack and offered to acquire the songs in addition to a small role somewhere else in the film. But Jackson was upset and shelved the songs. I don't understand. I mean, it makes me very sad. In the end, Johnny Depp was the only actor Burton considered for the role. Although interestingly, Dwayne The Rock Johnson was Burton's second choice in case Depp was unavailable. And you smell what the Wonka is cooking. Yeah, maybe not. And when it came to Depp, it was the first time Burton hadn't faced pushback from a studio about hiring the actor. Since Pirates of the Caribbean was a blockbuster success, Warner Brothers was more than happy to have him on board. It was important to Depp that he take Wonka in a completely different direction than Gene Wilder had in 1971. Depp and Burton saw Wonka as a children's television host, like Captain Kangaroo or Mr. Rogers. Hello, neighbor. Depp was also inspired by various game show 
show hosts. Depp wanted Wonka's hair to look like Prince Valiant, with high bangs and a bob, something unflattering that Wonka would think was cool because he'd been locked away for such a long time and didn't know any better. Depp also based Wonka's unique voice on how he imagined President George W. Bush sounded high on drugs. Hey, fool me, we can't get fooled again. The casting of the children was done very similar to the 1971 film, with children from the US and UK and Augustus casted from Germany. Burton was looking for kids who had some of the character in them and found Mike TV's part the hardest to cast. He was also having a hard time casting Charlie until Depp suggested Freddie Highmore, who he'd worked with on Finding Neverland. Gregory Peck was considered for the role of Grandpa Joe, but died just before being able to accept the role. Filming began on June 21, 2004 on film stages at Pinewood Studios in England, and also several locations across the country. Burton brought in close friend and composer Danny Elfman to handle the music for the film. Elfman was not only the lead singer for Oingo Boingo in the 80s, but he is also the voice singing for Jack Skellington in The Nightmare Before Christmas. To this day, Elfman has composed 19 of Burton's 22 major projects. Burton was filming Corpse Bride simultaneously with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and used most of the same team to make both movies. The Oompa Loompa was played by Deep Roy, thanks to his previous collaborations with Burton on Planet of the Apes and Big Fish. The actor played various Oompa Loompas thanks to the use of split-screen photography, digital, and front projection effects. Roy played a total of 165 individual Oompa Loompas in the film and said it was a rigorous experience, forcing him to work out intensely and follow a diet so his appearance remained unchanged during the filming. For Veruca Salt's demise at the hands of a hundred squirrels, Burton wanted the animals to be real. Believe it or not, 40 rescue squirrels were trained over 19 weeks. They were given props and taught how to sit on a bar stool, tap, and then open a walnut and deposit the insides on a conveyor belt. CGI was used when the squirrels were in close interaction with Veruca, but the rest was live squirrels. Thanks to a British equity rule that only allows children to work four and a half hours per day, the film took six months to shoot, ending in December 2004. The release of the movie on July 15, 2005 in 3,770 theaters coincided with a real golden ticket hunt by the Willy Wonka Candy Company, which at that time was owned by Nestle. The prize was $10,000 cash and a trip to Europe. Charlie the Chocolate Factory earned over $56 million during its opening weekend which was the fifth highest opening weekend in 2005. Earning almost $500 million worldwide, the movie was the eighth highest grossing film of 2005, behind movies like Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and Star Wars 3 Revenge of the Sith. With a $150 million budget, it was a complete success. And while the movie developed its own cult following, and some critics praised it as Burton's best work in years, there were criticisms for the film, especially for Depp. Roger Ebert, who had high praise for Gene Wilder's Wonka when the 1971 film came out compared Depp's performance to Michael Jackson. He was among several critics to make the comparison. He said Depp's performance was the weak spot in an otherwise mostly delightful film. Depp was surprised by the comparison and stated that he did not base his performance on Michael Jackson. Burton would go on to say, unlike Jackson, Depp's Wonka does not like children. <laughs> Despite the criticism, there were those that thought he played the character in the book perfectly, and like Gene Wilder before him, he received a Golden Globe nomination for his performance. Speaking of Wilder, it wasn't only some critics who didn't like the movie. Gene didn't understand why they wanted to remake Willy Wonka at all. In 2013, Wilder made further comments calling Burton's version an insult. He said he thinks Depp is a good actor and he likes him, but he didn't care for Burton, and while he's a talented man, he didn't care for him doing the movie the way he did. And perhaps Perhaps Burton had it coming. He had, after all, called the 1971 movie sappy and that he wasn't a fan of it. But the 2005 movie had made Warner Brothers a lot of money. So in October 2016, they reacquired the rights to the Willy Wonka character. It would take a couple years, but in February 2018, Wonka was set in motion with British director Paul Keane in negotiations to direct. That same year, the list of actors the studio was interested in included Donald Glover, Ryan Gosling, and Ezra Miller. 
It was also revealed that the film would serve as a prequel to the events of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. After a worldwide pandemic that shut down Hollywood, in January 2021, it was confirmed King would direct Wonka and Timothy Chalamet and Tim Holland were frontrunners for the title role. Both actors were hot, with Chalamet coming off of Dune and Tom Holland as Spider-Man. In May, Chalamet was cast with King saying he offered the actor the part with no audition after seeing his high school performance of Lil Timmy Tim rapping statistics on YouTube, which to King at least proved his vocal and dancing skills. We don't really see it. The script was co-written by King's Paddington 2 collaborators Simon Farnaby, Jeff Nathanson, and Simon Rich. In September 2021, Keegan-Michael Key, Rowan Atkinson, and others were announced as part of the cast. Production began in the UK in September 2021. Hugh Grant was cast to play Lofty the Oompa Loompa. King originally sent Grant a mock-up of the Oompa Loompa naked, which alarmed his little children. Grant said it was one of the most disturbing things he'd ever seen, and if it leaks out, a gen generation of children will be scarred. Grant's look for the role was taken from the Oompa Loompas in the 1971 movie. But unlike the 1971 movie where the Wonka bars were wood covered in fancy candy wrapping, the set of Wonka had an incredible chocolatier on the set. King said he gained 50 pounds from all the chocolate on set and said everything tasted better than they needed to and the actors didn't have to pretend how good they were. And perhaps the chocolate was a little too good because Chalamet got sick multiple times during production because of how much chocolate and candy he had to eat. Wonka opened in the UK on December 8th, 2023, and in the United States on December 15th. At the time of this video, Wonka is expected to have an opening weekend of between $35 and $45 million. The film will need to earn $250 million to break even. Reviews for the movie have been mostly positive as it's certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, and like Wilder and Depp before him, Chalamet was also nominated for a Golden Globe for his performance as Willy Wonka. The legacy of Willy Wonka can't be understated. Two Charlie and the Chocolate Factory video games were made in 1985 and 2005. There's a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory ride at Cloud Cuckoo Land at Alton Towers Theme Park in Staffordshire, England. There have also been three major stage adaptations of the story in 2004, 2010, and 2013. At one time, Netflix was even considering a TV series based on the famous chocolatier. The bottom line is that Willy Wonka's place in pop culture history is secure. And you can be certain Wonka isn't the last we'll see of Dahl's wonderful children's story and the magical chocolatier he imagined. And no matter what version of Wonka you like best between Wilder, Depp, or Chalamet, the one thing we can all agree on is that they've each brought the joy of Wonka to a new generation of children, and we can't wait to see what the future holds for the world's most famous confectioner. But what do you think? Which Willy Wonka is your favorite? Which movie do you like best? We want to hear about the first time you were introduced to Wonka. Let's talk about it in the comments below. Also, check out this incredible Wonka-inspired graphic design in our store. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. And please don't forget to check out our sponsor, Trade Coffee. They literally got us through the making of this video with so many late nights. Until next time.